You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am your host, Summer Gilbert, and I am the Director of Marketing and Branding here at Pacific Companies. And my co-host today is our EVP of Training here at Pacific Companies, Mr. Chris Call. Today on Provider's Perspective, we have the honor of speaking with family medicine physician, Dr. Sheila Bloomquist. Dr. Bloomquist is actually working overseas currently in beautiful Ireland. So we're really excited to talk to her about her journey through medicine and how she ended up practicing overseas. So without further ado, here is our episode with Dr. Sheila Bloomquist. First of all, um, Dr. Bloomquist, thank you so much for joining us on the Doc Lounge podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And Chris, thanks for being my co-host today. I enjoy being here. So we were lucky enough to get Dr. Bloomquist, and she is a very interesting woman. We have never had talk, spoken with a provider who is currently working overseas. So you are um, in Ireland right now, is that correct? Yes, I'm in, working based in Dublin. Swords Dublin is my clinic base. But during the pandemic, I had actually covered all of the clinics at some point, mostly Limerick and Cork for the time set they were either was short staffed or as the Limerick clinic was brand new in January. So I did a bit of traveling around internally for our group, but my home base is Swords. Yeah. Have you, have you found it hard to understand their strong accents um, or are you getting used to it? Well, not really, because my mother is actually from Limerick. So oh. I have um, the majority of my mother's family are actually still here. Some of them being in London, few scattered ones in Madrid. Um, but I have literally in Dublin, probably 40 or 50 cousins that I've not actually met. I've met maybe three of them so far. And of course, during the pandemic, I couldn't actually go visit anybody. So it was a very odd thing to be here and not be able to go see people. You know, so I've been capitalizing on that things now that lockdown is easing. And I've been down in Limerick pretty much every weekend that I can. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So let's take us to the beginning. What made you want to go into medicine? And, uh, you know, how did you get to where you are today? So the long and winding road will be the short answer. Um, the long answer, I, I don't remember not ever wanting not to be a doctor. My mother told me that probably is far back as when I was three, I was you know, doing injections on my teddy bears and they all have mercuricum stains and things like that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, I always was, was intrigued by all of that. Um, you know, I would be watching things with science on television. It completely grossed my mother out and I'd be all, you know, you know, into it. And when I was about 13, 14, then I really started making the plans because then I knew that I needed to start thinking ahead about pre-med but at the same time, I knew when I was a sophomore in high school that I wanted to do Madrid, study abroad, which if I did Marquette University, which I eventually went to, I could go directly through as part still of my university. So I had that planned out when I was 16 before I even got into university and then just kind of made sure I had my pre-med classes done. Um, when I was coming out of high school, 82, 83, because I graduated May of 83, it was where there was already a crisis for Spanish speaking personnel in the hospitals. So that already kind of set my mind that I was going to do probably um, it, at least a math, a, the a main degree in Spanish, if not like a dual degree. And I ended up just doing Spanish with pre-med because it opened up more jo jobs for job opportunities. Absolutely. So, you know, that's kind of where it landed me. I went to Madrid with Marquette stayed there three semesters, came home, graduated four months later, I was back in Madrid for NYU's master's program. And that way then I had kind of plans B because I'm the at plans A, B, C, and D girl, you know, as far as that goes. So I always had the working plan that could be modified. And then when I got um, to about 91, then I had to where I had enough of a financial backing to be able to apply to medical school so the question was, was I going to try and stay in Spain and do the co-validation route, or was I going to go back into the U.S. system? Grenada offered me a place, and so I ended up accepting for Grenada, and then I came home, did two pre-med classes that I hadn't had time to do, 
and then I went to Grenada. So once again, it took me halfway over the world and it was a great decision. Interesting. Do you see yourself practicing abroad rather than coming back to the U.S. in the near future? At this point in time, yeah, I'm, I'm probably about 10 years behind moving back to the side of the pond. When my mother uh, was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia back in 2010, early 2011, it sort of halted the ability for us to be able to move back because she really wanted to move to Spain with me. And I had started the co-validation process to be able to work there. And I had already been looking into working in Ireland. But when that happened, then I didn't have the infrastructure to actually take care of her. So then I put that on hold. But what I did do is go completely locum. So I was working nothing but locums in the States. That gave me 100% control of my schedule. Mm -hmm. I was able to devote a lot more time to being able to help take care of her. And I would essentially work nine months out of the year and take three months off of the year in like a four month block so that I could take them traveling and actually spend time with them. And so that still allowed me to start planning to eventually move over here. But it gave me a lot of that quality time that I wouldn't have had if I had stayed in a contract job at that point in time. Dr. Bloom, because we don't speak with too many physicians with your background, very interesting. And you bring up something that we haven't had in a podcast before regarding the co-validation. For our listeners that might be considering your route, can you just in a brief summary, walk us through what would that would entail? So it's been getting progressively easier over the years, especially the last decade. Similarly to when people come back into the system, into the U.S., which I actually had to do because I was considered a foreign grad since I had graduated from Grenada, you have the ECFMG system. What's interesting is that the ECFMG offices, they have now their U.S. system. They have created what they call Epic ECFMG for anybody who needs to get co-validated in a number of other countries. And so now that actually has really eased up the process. It still is each country having to fulfill requirements, but now that central file makes it a lot simpler. So as far as like when I had come back into the Irish system, I knew back as far as 2009 that the laws had changed for allowing uh, a lot of us that are Canadian, U.S. born, dual citizens to be able to come back into the system. And so I was able to get that done. It took me something like 355 days and 2,000 U.S. dollars to do it. And it was through them. And they were just starting to use the Epic ECFMG system. Now the UK uses it. Australia uses it. New Zealand. A lot of other countries are starting to tap into that because there's actually a global provider shortage and a global nurse shortage. So you'll see lots of places recruiting various you know, countries and you'll see a lot of Filipino nurses coming in for OB and different things like that. Not just in the US, but multiple countries. You'll see a lot of Filipino nurses even in Dublin. And so just the fact that this system is finally getting a little bit more internationalized is making it easier. But there's still you know, a lot of paperwork that has to be done you still need to make sure that you're going through the various um, U.S. entities and getting your kind of universal file updated and created mm -hmm. because that makes your life a lot easier for credentialing for even locums, but also for credentialing if you do anything international. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Do you find you ha you're, that you have more autonomy working overseas than you did working in the U.S.? Um, I had more autonomy when I was locums. And I really loved that. Now, the fact that I'm contract at the moment, it ended up being a blessing in disguise because what was happening during the pandemic, I arrived here about four months before the pandemic started. So I was right smack in the middle of the lockdown as it happened. I had been sent down to Cork at the beginning of March of 2020 to cover for a couple of shifts that had been short staffed. Sent back at the last week of March when we are in full on lockdown. And it was like the zombie apocalypse when I came back up on train to Houston Station. So just all of those changes were very radical. It was very hit hard here in the beginning. So between there and then, you know, in Spain, where my husband and a lot of family members live, you know, it was a complete lockdown. We couldn't see each other. We couldn't travel. You know, you barely traveled beyond your house to work. And so, and it still is only just now coming out of a lockdown here. 
so we can actually now go out to kind of outdoor cafes and things like that. Indoor dining still has not been reopened. So there's still a lot of things that are very different. So the contract actually protected me because what was supposed to have been a short contract, they ended up extending mm -hmm. because they said, look, you're here, we need you. You know, this is probably the safest way to do these things at the moment. And a few of my friends did go to New Zealand about six months ago for work and that, but going into countries for work that are still not out of lockdown, still a bit of a tricky situation. So you really have to do your planning, get your ducks in a row, make sure that your agencies are, you know, helping you plan this because it's not an easy feat at the moment. It will get easier. Right. But, you know, it is something that you, you have to do a lot more organization than you probably would have done two years ago. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I wanted to pursue um, switching gears a little bit, Dr. Bloom, because you're, you, according to your CV, you've done a lot of work with some like underserved populations, Indian health and so forth. Uh, that's a unique population and, you know, it takes uh, physicians with big hearts to go to that challenging population. What brought you to that uh, conclusion in your career to say, this is a population I want to focus on? Well, once again, that actually goes back to when I was, you know, probably in junior high, high school. My godmother was originally from South Dakota. So she was raised near some of the Sioux reservations and several of her relatives had actually worked for the IHS in those areas. So I'd always been kind of hearing about it. You know, they were always kind of putting that little seed in place. It was, you know, well, you might want to think about this when you get your career finished in that. When I got out of my OB fellowship in Oak Park, Illinois, I had decided that five years of winter in Chicago, as much as I adore Chicago and it's my home state, I just had had enough of winter. And so I went Southwest because it was the closest thing to the Spanish culture without actually being back in Spain. And uh, I just started looking at what the job opportunities were. And I started looking at all of the IHS facilities. And I thought, you know, I, I think this is a good place to do. So I ended up interviewing for White River Apache, four of the Navajo sites, and Hopi. And I ended up deciding on Hopi for the first two years. And I went out there in 2006, worked there for two years. But what's interesting about the Hopi facility, because it's a very small reservation right smack in the middle of the Navajo reservation, it's a 50-50 split a lot of times, your patient population, but still very different cultures, lovely people really just interesting because that's like going to another country you know they mm -hmm. have their autonomy they have their nations they have their cultures they're trying to keep their languages alive and those are things i really appreciated so you know that really was something i think i was destined to do i ended up going into holbrook town then and i was the gp there for four years and I decided then after that to go locum. So I was working for a, a stat clinics group that eventually got bought out by Banner. So their five clinics were very different populations. A lot of Native Americans would be coming into those, but it would be a mix of Latino. And I still would go up to the Navajo reservation for five of those eight years. And I was working at Shiprock then up there as well. So it was just a nice varied type of, of work. I was up in Shiprock doing some A&E, urgent care, family medicine, same day, OB backup call, similar to what I'd done at Hopi. And so it gave me kind of the best of both worlds. And I still have some very close friends up there. I really just love the area, love the people. Wonderful. Wow. I remember speaking with another physician that worked on a reservation and she said she had a little bit of a difficulty um, connecting with her patients and really gaining their trust because she wasn't Native American. Did you run into any of that? Uh, well, a reservation clinic is never an easy place to work um, depending on the location. I mean, there's a lot of poverty, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to kind of get to your head. You're not gonna change everything. Yeah. You do the best you can to help with who you can. Um, but there's a lot of things that are going to take a lot more than you just to change it. Um, at the same time, though, if you're open and, you know, really just willing to try and make connections with people, you know, it definitely, I, I came with some very, very close friends, people who I consider like my family. So I never had as much issue as far as that goes. 
I think where Hopi was a little bit more challenging for me is when it was coming towards the time frame that my mother was starting to not do so well before the diagnosis came and I was having to commute back and forth to Spain to see my husband as well. So it was not the easiest place to be able to travel from, whereas from uh, Shiprock, it was a little bit easier because I was closer to airports, closer to you know some transport in that mm-hmm. respect. So those would be the things that would be sometimes more challenging. Some friends, they had situations where if their spouse was able to work from home and their children were smaller, then that was fine. If there were schooling issues later on or if the spouse was also needed to work, then that sometimes, depending on how remote the area would be, could be the determining factor. Yeah. Now, post-pandemic, that could completely change because as we've discovered, most of the world can work from home if they need to, barring a few of us that actually have to be in the clinic. So I think lots of those things will change. I think in a lot of ways, the pandemic, as hard as the Navajo reservation had it, as far as the pandemic goes, they really pulled up the bootstraps, dug in, and they became an example to the world of what can be done on a shoestring budget because Mm -hmm. they had so much better control. They had vaccination rates that I think were second in the world, second only to Dubai and the United Arab Emirates as far as like a couple months ago. They just did so well. And so I think they kind of showed the world, you know, you don't have to have a lot of this flashy stuff if you have the will and the desire to just do it right from the beginning. Yeah. So, you know, it's an example to all of us. So with all your years experience practicing medicine and then also practicing in many different settings, what advice would you give to a med student who's ready to choose their specialty and head out into the real world of medicine? Well, first thing, don't decide that you want to be an ENT like, for the rest of your life until you've actually done lots of different rotations and really just keep an open mind. See what you gravitate to. It may change and modify over time. And also start looking, you know, I always work with my little five-year plan. Start looking at what you want to do in say five or 10 years, not only professionally, but family. Keep that balance because the balance is so very important. But for me, for example, I knew I wanted to do family medicine because that had a much broader range of what I could do and where I could go. Even as far as when I was teaching advanced life support with the Mexican team, which I'm still part of, and you're going to Latin America and different places. Then it evolved into, I ended up doing urgent care more. So then I got board certified for that. There had always been the integrative medicine seed planted from when I was even before I was in in medical school and then definitely in residency because my residency program had that already sort of embedded into the program. So then I just finished that and I actually found out last Monday that I passed my boards for that. And so it always evolves. So build on it, keep your family balance and still do what you like. Mm -hmm. Be where you want to be. There's always ways to get there. But if you start landing just out of fear onto that first contract or, oh, I I need to stay here for another five years because I may not be able to switch, keep it flexible, keep your balance, take care of yourself. You know, the self-care part, they're only just now teaching. That's so very important. But at the end of the day, you need to be happy. Your family needs to be happy and you need to feel satisfied with your job. So if you're not happy with something, you need to start looking at, well, what is the problem here? Is it that you just need to change your scenery? Is it that you feel like you're stagnating where you need to be doing something else as far as, you know, maybe subspecialty or just something for fun? You know, you want to learn Russian, go learn Russian. Do stuff that opens your brain and so that you're not stagnating Mm -hmm. because that is what your life is going to be like for the next 25, 30 or more years. You need to like your life. Yeah. So that's a very important thing. And and you seem to like your life, given the varied experiences of you kind of moving around. It seems like it's never boring uh, in your world. Oh, no, definitely not boring. The next couple of weeks are going to be a whirlwind because now I finally be will be able to move some stuff out and get my home base replanted. But I always keep that door open. I always keep my U.S. licenses and everything up to date because there's always that possibility 
that, you know, I'll start doing the locum's life again, yeah. you know, three months, take three months off, work three months. I have friends who have been doing that for years and they are having a blast of a time. They still do good medicine, but they're enjoying their semi-retirement and it's fabulous. Well, you know who to call when you uh, want to look up some locums opportunities. So we, we got a bunch. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm really impressed. Like I can tell, I love talking to physicians when, when you, you pretty much smile when you're talking about everything, whether it's your experience with your giving advice, um, you love what you do. And I'm, I'm guessing it's been hard at times and everything, but I can see you chose the right career path for yourself. Am I getting that right? And I still have creative parts of my brain that I'm still doing other things, but you know, I really love my job. If yeah. I didn't love my job, I think I would have, you know, left and gotten burned out. And I've been through burnout one and a half times. So, you know, yeah. and if I have survived at that point in time, and that's when I had to change gears. When you get back to your basics of what you need and you start looking after yourself more with the self-care so being so very important, that's where you will start liking your life again and mm -hmm. eventually loving your life. If you're starting to really not like what you're doing and feeling like just everything is a drag, it's time to re-examine things because you need to switch it up. Another question that we like to ask physicians is what advice would you give to healthcare administrators to strengthen that relationship between the providers and the hospital administrators, CEOs, in-house recruiters, um, and such. Feedback. I would say they need to be more flexible because um, several previous bosses who are still good friends of mine have said to me, if you give people the freedom to roam periodically, they will come home. They will come back to you. And one very interesting example, when I was just a medical student still, Pekin Hospital, I did a MECO program for the summer when I was home from school for a year because I had to stay home to work. And so there's a surgeon there and he basically had said to them, look, I want to um, take three months off so that I have family time because I will work hard for you for nine months, but I need these three months of the summer when my children are off school so that I can actually have a family life. And they did it. You know, they actually, they wanted him bad enough that they were able to accommodate for those. And for places that have accommodated their staff in the, past they keep that staff longer and they are able to actually um not only have a loyalty but a really strong bond working relationship almost like a friendship because those people will work harder and longer for you mm -hmm. if you give them the lack that they need and it's going to prevent burnout too when you have that open communication absolutely and then also just even sometimes create developing creative sidelines because you know if somebody is interested in maybe doing other studies for you know an mph or for integrative medicine or for whatever subspecialty you know many times those things can be brought back into that clinic they may not be obvious about how but with a little bit of creativity let your staff kind of do those things develop the other parts of their brain and bring it back into the clinic it's, i mean it, anything is possible if yeah. you're willing to it just go that distance. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's so important that people open up and and not keep it inside and share. That's the only way we're going to grow. So. Exactly. So on a lighthearted note, um, and I can kind of hear it in your voice already, um, how do you feel like your Irish accent is so far? <laughs> well, my accent is a mess on a good day because when I go down to see the relatives, I start talking like them. <laughs> And all of the um, Americans don't know that I'm American. The Canadians kind of figured out that I'm American. And other people call me a Canadian, which my Canadian cousins think are hilariously funny. And so, I mean, it's just, it's a muddle. You, you do know? have, it like, always, when you talk, uh, I can hear like different, like kind of English, but then there's a little bit of like the Irish, you know, and then the Spanish. So I'm like, wait, okay. She says so she's picking up. And put me in London. My cousin's there for the weekend and it's completely disastrous. So I mean, it just, it, 
that's what happens with the Midwestern accent. And my mother had a Midwestern Irish accent. So it happened with her as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's yeah. so great. That's so fun. All right. Well, um, one more thing is I see that you, you're working on a documentary. I have several film projects that got put on hold. Uh -huh. So there's a couple of things that I'm going to try and recreate. Um, this weekend when I was down in Cork and Limerick with a cousin of mine, uh, we ended up coming up with a totally different plan about um, the GA clubs because her uh, second son is a big hurling player down there. And so who knows? I mean, I think that project will probably get done before everything else now, just mm -hmm. because, you know, the most imminent one that we can actually do and maybe get some money for. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. There's several in the works. You know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And it's always good when you're surrounding yourself with the medical stuff um, day in and day out to have a creative outlet just gives you that balance, much needed balance in your life. And I can see you're doing that. Exactly. So. Well, what's the rest of your day look like today? Well, I actually had a day off today because they got stuck for Saturday. So I got loads done and I'm trying to uh, do the deep clean and purge to prepare for my next round of exams and uh, pack because I'll be going down to Spain finally in about three weeks. And um, yeah, just try and get organized. You know, I do this thing purge thing before um, each major exam. So get myself reorganized. So and it's almost yeah. 8, 8 p.m. there, right? Yeah, it's still very sunny. They usually it's sunny here now until about 1030 at night because we're so far 50 parallel. OK. Wow. Interesting. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's it going to be a really lovely, bright day. It was yeah. really nice. Well, thank you, Dr. Bloomquist, for taking the time to talk to us. It was a pleasure getting to know you. And I'm looking forward to following up with you and see how the documentaries go and where else your medical journey takes you. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Bye. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And a big thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast could not be possible. If you would like to be a guest, go to www.pacificcompanies.com. Thank you.